Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have Martin Barnes, the Chief Econom Economist with BCA Research, joining us this morning from Victoria, BC, Canada. Welcome, Martin. Good morning to you, Gordon. How is the weather in Victoria? It's always beautiful there. Absolutely spectacular. <laughs> I know. I, a wonderful summer, thank you. I grew up in Saskatchewan. and going to Vancouver and Victoria in the winter was a treat. But it was 30 below and I flew over those mountains. <laughs> Right. So, but now, but it's it's early fall here. So, uh, Martin, some of our uh, listeners may not be familiar with your background. I wonder if you could uh, give them an overview of the things you've been involved with, even before you went to BCA Research. Okay, I'll try and keep it short. I've been working as an economist now for an embarrassingly long time, over 40 years. I'm, I'm from Scotland, you may detect from my accent. So I graduated in economics in 1972 in Glasgow. Worked for British Petroleum as an economist for five years in the early 70s, so went through the first oil crisis with them. Then I was a chief economist with a UK brokerage firm for 10 years, from 77 till 87, when BCA discovered me. I got a phone call from this company in Montreal, where the heck is that, asking me if I'd like to come and join BCA as an economist. And one thing led to another, so I grabbed my wife and kids over to Canada, and that, that was 28 years ago. So over the last 28 years, I've been with BCA for most of the time writing their flagship monthly bank credit analyst publication. I passed that on a couple of years ago to a colleague, and I'm chief economist now, run our conference, uh, run our research advisory board, write special reports, and spend a lot of, way too much time traveling, visiting clients all over the world. I, I have That's to, it in a nutshell. <laughs> I have to say to our, our listeners that uh, haven't aren't familiar with BCA research, and I know many will, will be, it is absolutely top flight research uh, great publication. I've been following it since it was called Bank Credit Analyst years ago, and uh, and it's just it's really well done. And I compliment you on it. I, I have to say that I would be amiss on it on doing that. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Martin. It's been around a long time since 1949. The company, so yeah, it's, it, exactly, Martin. Uh, you recently published a report entitled "Low Growth and High Debt." financial repression is here to stay, and that is our theme here: is financial repression. And I wonder if you could define what you mean by financial repression you know, what in your terms and how you think of it and then take us through the the key points in the article and what the message was well i guess most people would define financial repression in this environment where interest rates are sort of kept below levels that most people would consider normal for one reason or another in the case of my article i it was really focused on on the problems of continued high levels of debt. So pretty much everywhere around the world, maybe the one or two exceptions, governments are struggling with very high debt levels, which are only going to get worse over the coming years, given aging populations and the burden that's going to put on, on government finance through, through pensions and healthcare payments. Um, at the same time, of course, you've got very high private sector debt levels in a lot of countries as well, which adds to uh, financial stability vulnerability issues. So when a country's got a lot of debt and running deficits, there are ways out of it. And Canada found a way out of it in, in, the, in the mid 90s. You can have fiscal restraint, bring order back into your finances. Hopefully you'll get better economic growth that allows you to grow out of the problem. That route is going to be very difficult uh, in the current environment. A, you've got governments around the world who are not that keen on any more fiscal austerity. Um, if anything, you've got swings going the other way. It calls for more government spending, not less. 
And the global growth environment, as we all know, is is less than brilliant at the moment. So it's very hard for companies to grow out of their debt problems. You can inflate it away, the traditional way that uh, you know some countries have, have got out of their debt, debt problems, just devalue their money. So you owe, you owe your uh, the holders of your bonds, you know, hundred billion dollars, and you just pay them back in you know devalued money twenty years down the road. You could argue that that's exactly what central banks are trying to do with quantitative easing, print money, create inflation. But no central banker would argue that they're trying to create a lot of inflation. This generation of central bankers that we have almost everywhere still is very anti-inflationary at their core. Yeah, they don't want deflation. Yeah, they're prepared to do crazy things in order to try and stimulate demand. But nobody is targeting high inflation. So at the moment, that is off the table as a, as a way forward. You can always default. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, Greece, of course, defaulted effectively. But So how are you going to get out of your debt burdens? You, you, it's very hard to grow out of them. You're not prepared to inflate your way out of them. It's going to be very difficult to have enough fiscal restraint, especially given the scale of the demographic challenge that lies ahead. So you're left kind of stuck uh, with debt levels that seem to be unsustainable. And I I use that wonderful quote in my report that uh, has been used many times by many people. You know, the Herbstein, the late Herbstein economist said, you know, something is unsustainable, it will stop. So you look at debt levels around the world, they look unsustainable. So something has to give somewhere along the line. And I guess I concluded, well, if you can't easily get your debt burdens down for all the reasons I mentioned, then at a minimum, you have to make it easier to live with. And the only way you can make your debt easier to live with is through financial repression, primarily by having very low interest rates. You can finance an extraordinary large amount of debt for a long, long time if your interest rates are close to zero. Mm -hmm. Zero times a big number is still zero. So you look at Japan, it's had government debt levels, 200% of GDP, no problem at all because its government bond yields have been 1% or less for, for quite some time. So that is the way forward for governments if they cannot reduce their debt burdens by the more normal routes. They're just going to have to make sure that those debt burdens don't cause problems. And the way you do that is have very low interest rates. And you can have leg- regulatory issues as well that you can force um your institutions to own more government debt, you know, dressed up as, you know, it's for their own good for regulatory, you know, increase their capital ratios. It's safer for them, for them to own government debt than it is, you know, to, to make loans, etc. So a combination of regulatory pressures and just very low interest rates will allow countries to live with their high debt burdens. So that's the kind of the essence of the, of the argument. But, the, but We're I, not at that point at the moment, by the way. I mean, I would argue we've got very low interest rates at the moment as well, but that's not because of an overt uh, attempt by governments to make it easier to live with high debt. That is not why interest rates are low today. Governments are not having any problems financing their debt burdens at the moment. People are desperate to own safe assets. Interest rates are low today because we're stuck with low growth and very easy monetary policies. For other reasons, inflation is low. So my fears or, or discussion about financial repression is down the road. If we can't get the, the debt levels down, then financial repression seems the logical way forward for governments. So we have low interest rates today for reasons other than financial. There is financial repression, but it's, it's a byproduct of what's happening. At some point in the future, it may become a direct objective. I want, I want, to, I, I want to talk about it going in the future of what unintended consequences and a number of other things are, fall out from this. But I, I fully actually agree with your observation or your, your thesis here that it really keeping the low interest rates Helps them finance the debt. It's the only and, and keeping costs effectively lower so that the debt is is sustainable. But you also mentioned in your paper that it using regulatories to incent or force the buying of of the of the treasuries of the sovereign debt itself. Incentives, if you would, is is a key right. is a key part of sustaining uh, this this direction. Is it not? 
Well, that if if you have a lot of debt and private investors are not prepared to buy it without you know markedly higher interest rates, and you don't want interest rates to go up, then you can encourage others to buy it, you know, through through regulatory means. Um, now, at the moment, you know, in recent years, of course, we have seen uh, pressures put on banks to boost capital ratios. Okay. Um, understandably so, because capital ratios got way too low during the, the bubble years, the crazy years. So it was inevitable that, that financial institutions were going to be forced to, to reduce leverage, improve capital ratios. And one way they do that is to own more lower risk assets like government bonds. But you can also have more direct involvement by governments in the financial sector just by mandating pension funds to you know, have X percent of their portfolios in government bonds as opposed to, you know, which may be higher than they currently have. Um, this way you can, you know, countries like Japan have had a captive audience for their bond market through their postal savings system. You know, the, they were running this huge debt levels, but the government sector itself, or the part of the quasi-government sector was was funding it. So there are ways to do that. Again, I wouldn't say we're at that point now, but again, that, that down the road, if the private sector is not there to, to buy your debt, then you can force changes to make, make that happen. Pre- uh, precisely. And, and, <clears throat> and there are various countries at various stages um, in that process. But the unintended consequences, what when we have low interest rates for this sustained period of time, and, it, and as you're arguing, you think this is going to continue, there's, there's serious fallouts from that. I, I personally see mispricing of risk, malinvestments, lack of price disco- discovery, just on a day-to-day basis. What are your views on that? Okay, well, I, I mean, yes, of course. Low, low interest rates are going to encourage some misbehavior. Let's put it this way. The way I would phrase it is, you know, if money is free, very clever people at some point are going to do stupid things with it. So there's no question that uh, low interest rates w- will encourage speculation, leverage, etc., cetera, et cetera. But I would also argue that it's, it, it's hard to, to make the claim that today's interest rates are dangerously low um, and causing economic problems. If, you could always argue the, actually the opposite. So people have worried about inflation ever since quantitative easing began several years ago. Uh, we haven't got much inflation today. So you've had the Fed do you know its quantitative easing and maintain zero interest rates. You've had the ECB, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan doing doing the same. And yet commodity prices have been falling sharply. Inflation rates are way below the levels that governments want, the 2% target that most countries have. And economic growth around the world has been disappointing. So if interest rates were lower than the economy needs, things should be booming. The economy should be knocking the lights out. We should be seeing inflation pressure. You should be seeing debt growth rise. And you're not seeing that at all. So we're in a world and environment, I would argue, that needs low interest rates at the moment. Now, that may change in the future, um, but at the moment, I, I think you know, the, the, the global economy needs low interest rates. You could even argue it needs them to be even lower than they are today, which is going to be hard to achieve. Um, so, yeah, the byproduct is financial distortions, and that's, uh, you know, call it collateral damage, call it what you will. That's a, an unfortunate byproduct, and, of course, it has powerful implications for certain groups of people you know i feel for people trying to live on fixed income interest from you know if they've got all their money in the bank or in government bonds and they're trying to live off the income good luck with that i mean but you can't push interest rates up to protect the interest of those people if the global economy actually is screaming for even lower rates. Yeah, the world of the pensioner... It's like an equation that can't be solved. You know, you, there's no way that we can have a level of interest rates that's going to have everybody happy. The world of the pensioner and saver today is a very, very tough world uh, for that they're living. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. They, uh, and, you know, for the, those that 
don't have pensions. They're in uh, contributory pension plans. 401ks aren't large. Uh, there's a lot of worry there if these policies are sustained for a, for a longer period of time. You have in that in that context, you have a large institutional falling following at BCA Research. What are the pension plans, for example, doing to maintain well, at these low know, rates? Th this this environment is horrific for pension funds from from both sides of their balance sheet because you know when they value their liabilities you know they, their liabilities are all the pensions that they know they're going to have to pay out over the next 20 30 40 50 years they discount those back to the present using a discount rate and the lower the discount rate which is effectively an interest rate the higher the present value of those liabilities so the, the present value of their future liabilities has gone up as interest rates have come down and the returns that they can get on their assets, at least their fixed income assets, has gone down. So they're getting squeezed from both sides of their balance sheet. So it, it's, it's horrific. Now, the good is this, the good is this news, forcing, uh, Sorry, Martin, is this forcing them to take on more risk to make well, these kinds of they've deals? Been, they've been bailed out in, the, in, in recent years to some extent because the stock market's been been so good because low interest rates and this is what quantitative easing by the way of course was designed to do it was to force people out of low risk assets into higher risk assets people have put money more money into the stock market and the stock market has been great I mean the stock market given how weak the global economy has been the stock market is up the global index is up, oh gosh, what, 140% from its March lows. Um, the U.S. market's been up, you know, way more than that, 190% or whatever. So pension funds still have a lot of their assets in the stock market, you know, whether it's a traditional 60 equity, 40 bond split, doesn't matter. So the stock market has delivered returns way better than they would have expected a few years ago. So their overall returns uh, haven't been so bad, even though the, the returns are on their fixed income part of their portfolios. So, well, they've not been bad as well, actually, because more interest rates have come down. So the problem is, so the problem is that the, the journey to low interest rates has actually been quite good because bond yields have fallen, giving you good bond returns. The stock market's got up, giving you good stock market returns. But once you arrive at your destination, uh, interest rates hit a very low level and then just kind of get stuck there, then you hit into a problem. Then your bond bond returns get stuck at that at the low level of rates, um, which let's call it 2%. So you you may get 2% from your bond portfolio now going forward. And if you were to buy a 10-year bond and hold it for its maturity, that's what you're going to get, say 2%. And the stock market... Once you've pushed it up to levels that valuations start to look dodgy, which you could argue happened certainly in the U.S. this year, you can't expect stock market returns to be great going forward either. So we've had a – they've been bailed out in recent years by the journey. <laughs> now they've arrived at their destination. Stock markets are expensive. Bond yields can't really go a whole lot lower here. Um, so future returns – for pension funds are going to be problematic. So when you have in the U.S. big state pension funds like CalPERS or you know some of these others still targeting over seven percent a year, you scratch your head and be amused and wonder, well, how how are they going to achieve that? It seems arithmetically impossible because you know that their bond the, the returns on their bond portfolios are not going to be anything close to that. And even I would argue that stock returns are not going to be great from here. In fact, when I do the math, and I've been telling our clients this for quite some time, you know, a typical balanced portfolio um, of, of, say, 60 65% equities, 30, you know, 35 40 bonds with a bit of an international mix, you should be expecting 4 to 5% total returns over the next decade per year before inflation and before taxes. Well, taxes don't matter to pension funds, but four to five, which is less than half of what they've experienced over the last three decades. Um, so it's a problem. Um, and, you know, that's all the markets are going to be capable of delivering you. Um, so what do you do? You can, you can take on more leverage and try and juice your returns up that way, but we all know that that has risks associated with it. Now, 
some people would argue, well, it's a case for going into alternative assets, hedge funds, private equity, real estate, etc. Well, what's interesting there is we know that hedge fund performance has not been great in recent years. In fact, CalPERS, going back to them, have pulled out of hedge funds altogether, which is an astounding thing. Private equity has done well over the years, but my understanding is, I think I'm right, that private equity funds in the U.S. are sitting on over a trillion dollars of what they nicely call dry powder, money that they have waiting to be invested. Now, if they've already got a trillion dollars that they haven't been able to find a home for, if more money flows into them because investors are trying to diversify and get better returns, what are they going to do with that money? Uh, put it into ever worse deals so the returns are not going to be great there either. So there's no simple answer here. Real estate, yeah, you could argue that real estate is an attractive place to be. But again, returns there have been pushed down to, to quite low rates. The cap rates, the, their kind of equivalent yield, if you like, is now quite low by historical standards. So it's, that is the real challenge facing investors. Where do you go in a world of, of, of low returns? Stocks look a little bit expensive and risky in a lot of places. Bonds aren't attractive at these low yields. Cash gives you nothing. It is what it is, in a sense. And I don't have the... Answer. Now, what will happen, of course, uh, is that nothing goes in a straight line. We will get a big seller. We will get another bear market in stocks. Now, what we've been going through has not really been a bear market, just a much needed correction that may have further to run. We don't really know. But if, if at some point you get a 20, 25 percent, 30 percent drop in equity markets, all of a sudden you've restored value. Maybe we'll get a spike in bond yields at some point, you know, with the Fed raising rates or whatever reason. So if 10-year yields go from their current just over 2% to, say, over 3%, then they become more attractive again. So markets will not be in a straight line. At some point, we will create betting at buying opportunities that will give you better prospective returns from that. But first of all, <laughs> you've got to go through the downturn first. It- so you have to suck <laughs> There's no, but if we were just take locking in today's valuations and saying, okay, what are my returns going to be from here? They're not attractive. I'm thinking of your comments on on pension plans and pension funds, with the pro, with all the issues they face, and then if you have a, a significant drawdown um, in in the not too distant future, but a lot of the a lot of the pensions and the public pensions are seriously underfunded to start with. Yeah. Uh, like I think in the United States, I know they are, the state, local, and city funds are underfunded by close to $4.7 trillion. Oh. So then you have 75 million <laughs> baby boomers in the United States about to decide that at 10000 a day, they need the money now and coming out. That's a well, tight squeeze yeah. there, is there not? Oh, sure, absolutely. But I think we all know the issue with, with, with pension funds and especially defined benefit plans. You know, was it Bismarck, I think, that, that in Germany that came up with the first kind of uh, public pension fund back at the turn of the last century where, you know, the, this idea that people should get a pension when they reach 60 or 65, whatever, in the U.S., I guess, that happened in the 30s. Um, but when those plans were put in place, life expectancy was... Yes, exactly. 60, 60, 65. You were never supposed to either live long enough to collect a pension or certainly not live long enough to get it for very for very many years. You're supposed to maybe get a pension for a couple of years and die. Nobody envisaged in those when they set those plans up that people would live for 30 years or even longer on a, pen, on a public pension, the government paying people to go and play golf or whatever. Um, so they never raised the pension age as life expectancy went up. How stupid was that? And they made... Re- promises on future returns that were maybe looked sensible in the context of returns that were available back then. But now in a world of low returns and people are living longer, the promises that were made a long time ago when they set these plans up no longer can be met. And I think everybody understands that at some point those promises have to to change, either by raising retirement age, means testing benefits, raising contribution rates. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I will just re- <laughs> re- retreat to that Herb Stein quote, you know, if something's unsustainable, it will stop. And um, 
the the math or the arithmetic behind a lot of these pension schemes is unsustainable. Therefore, it will change. Mar so uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. Martin, we're getting up against our hard line, and I, I'd be amiss if I didn't get a chance to ask you, what is your outlook right now for the Canadian economy? Commodity prices falling, I know, currencies down. Uh, what, what do you foresee in the next, and housing specifically uh, in Canada? It seems to be a little bit of a bubble in some places anyway, but what's your views? Um, it's not... It's not disastrous, but we, we, we've got the same problem all, you know, that so many other economies have. We're stuck in, in very low growth. The whole global environment is kind of marching through sort of not, it's not quicksand, certainly it's heavy going. So our exports are battling against a headwind of, of, of moderate global growth, slow growth in world trade. The big disappointment, of course, has been that the big drop that we've seen in the Canadian dollar hasn't led to as much of a pickup in exports as one might have hoped. Now, the latest data shows exports finally rising, so hopefully that's the start of uh, a more lasting trend. We'll have to wait and see. We're still very closely tied to the U.S. Most of our trade is with the U.S. The U.S. economy is doing okay. It's not booming. It's kind of stuck at this two-and-a-half-ish kind of growth rate, but at least it's growing. So... That's a positive for us. Um, monetary policy is going to stay easy for a very long time. Just as a side note, the governor of the Bank of Canada, Steve Pollos, worked for us for five years. Uh, he was one of our economists. I, he lived around the corner from me. I used to drive him in and out of work every day, so I know him quite well. And he's a good guy, and he's concerned about downside risks, has been for a long time. So he's going to keep policy very easy. Housing, by every standard metric, looks incredibly overdone, especially, of course, in Toronto and Vancouver. But I doubt it's going to crash. It, it's probably going to more sandpaper erode its way lower rather than crash. People, we didn't have the, we don't have the ninja loan problem, you know, that the U.S. had of giving, you know, no income, no jobs kind of loans. So the quality of the mortgage lending has been higher here. Uh, a lot of the crazy buying is, seems to be from overseas people that are paying cash. So we don't have the same financial vulnerability associated with the housing boom here, but it's hard to get away from the fact that house prices are, are, are you know, not extraordinarily high here and likely to, to erode. Um, the resort, the commodity price stuff, yeah. I mean, we're not optimistic on commodity prices. China, is moving away from its kind of commodity oriented growth to a more service oriented model. So we had this phenomenal sucking in of commodities into China for you know, almost 10 years. That's done. Uh, the global economy is not growing that rapidly. Even everywhere is kind of moving away from commodity oriented growth to, you know, the high tech kind of growth is is less commodity intensive. I love the example of Kodak, you know, that in the old days, you know, we had cameras and films, they had all kinds of chemical content in the films themselves and in the processing of the films and you employed people in laboratories to develop your, you know, your, your mm -hmm. films. Now it's Instagram. Kodak effectively is out of business, you know, and now it's all just done by apps and digital and you've just moved away from a sort of, commodities, but we pro we're producing more photographs than ever before, but none of them involve commodities per se, whereas in the old days it did. So the world is moving away from its commodity dependence, I think, which is not great for Canada. Um, we'll adjust to that. We'll adjust. I, I'm not pessimistic on, on, on Canada, but we're, we're facing a challenge of it's a tough global environment. Martin, great, great observations, and I, I really appreciate them. Uh, we have to, unfortunately, have to break now. Could you tell our listeners how they could learn more about uh, BCA research and uh, and your writings, actually? Well, BCA is has been around since 1949. We're based in in Montreal, and um, we're probably the world's largest independent macro research firm. Our focus is to figure out where the markets are going and advise our clients who are primarily institutions. So we're very much an institutional mm -hmm. firm um, and we cover the, the the range of asset classes. We have research on commodities and currencies in China, uh, Europe, equities, bonds, you name it. 
um, and we publish weekly, daily stuff on on these assets. And we are very, we're very much the business model is to be in close touch with our clients. So I and my colleagues spend a lot of time traveling around, talking to our clients about what's going on. We run a big conference every year in New York. That's coming up at the end of this month. I'm spending an hour at that conference interviewing Ben Bernanke. So that's my next uh, task is to put my questions together for that. But, uh, you know, we're a serious firm and we do serious research. But the key thing is we're primarily institutional, so rather than retail. Martin, thank you very much for the time. We're going to have to have you back. Uh, there's so much here I, I wanted to talk to you about, but just have to be in the next time we talk. So thank you again. Well, it's been my pleasure. Nice Bye -bye. talking to you. Bye.